Good day, everyone, wherever you are and whatever time it is. I'm Mark Freeman from the College of the Holy Cross. It's great to be here with you all. It'll also be great to actually see Jens Brockmeyer, not just because he's a colleague and friend I've known for a long time, but also because, as he knows, the last time I saw him was in a very weird dream I had a little while back. Disturbing, in fact. Weird, disturbing dreams involving Jens Brockmeyer aside, it really is a privilege and a pleasure to introduce him today. For those of you who don't know Jens, as well as for those of you who do, he's something of a Renaissance person. And for that reason, I suppose I'll call him Professor Brockmeyer. If his profile is at all accurate, and I'm pretty sure it is, he received degrees in psychology, philosophy, and linguistics, literary theory from the Free University Berlin. He's also had teaching and research appointments at places ranging from OISI, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto, to the New School in New York, to the University of Oxford. I know he's also spent some time in Innsbruck, Austria, for a long while, in fact, doing the wonderful things he does. As for where he is now, he's been at the American University of Paris since 2014, where he continues to write important books, chapters, and articles, all of which are concerned in one way or another with what he describes as the cultural fabric of mind and language, focusing especially on narrative. As a psychological, linguistic, and cultural form and practice, his recent books include a co-edited volume on literacy, narrative, and culture. Another co-edited volume titled Beyond Loss, Dementia, Memory, and Identity. A book titled Cultura e Narrazione, Culture and Narrative. And not least, a quite extraordinary book called Beyond the Archive, Memory, Narrative, and the Autobiographical Process. It's a book I know well. To top it off, and I think this is a somewhat little known fact, he has a passion for opera and has done a lot of work in that area too, and is pretty well versed in art history as well. All of this bespeaks a wide open mind and a real passion for ideas, wherever they may be. Please join me today in welcoming Professor Jens Prockmeyer. Like many other people during uh, the weeks and months of the corona lockdown, I spent a lot of time reading papers and magazines about what, what, of course, about the lockdown, about what it does, does to the people affected. What I want to do in my little talk is to share some observations and reflections on these readings on the lockdown as a psychological state as a psychological constellation. I was puzzled to see how often I came across the concept of the self, this uh, time-honored battle horse that has managed to survive uh, whatever combat and crisis it has encountered. Often the concept of the self is <clears throat> employed in it, uh, interchangeably with that of identity, sometimes also with that of the ego. Well, given how most psychologists view their field of research and intervention, the focus on the self is not that surprising. What I think is most striking, however, is a particular understanding of the self. A self, the modern self, our self, the Western self, that is affected by a crisis. These days, of course, by the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. Even the simple semantics are quite widespread. There's, there's a self and there's a crisis, and then the self is affected by the crisis and perhaps by the way the crisis is managed. Maybe because this formula is so simple and so often repeated explicitly and 
implicitly that it appears logical or at least plausible. Of course, there's a variety of more suggestive versions of the self in crisis. Some are more clinical. A lot has been written about uh, uh, the self and its crisis in terms of depression, anxiety, helplessness, alcohol and drug abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, even psychoses in individuals living under conditions of lockdown or quarantine. Other versions are more political and sociological, emphasizing experiences of powerlessness, loss of independence, control, agency, sovereignty, freedom. <clears throat> Despite the complexity that all these experiences and qualities bring to the picture, what underlies this view is a highly problematic idea. First of all, that there is a self, an independent, stable and functioning identity, entity, I should say, that um, secondly, now comes under heavy attack, like a viral organism that comes under attack when a coronavirus is inhaled and infects the lung tissue, like an intruding microbiotic terrorist, as an epidemiologist called the virus. But before this, before the attack, the organism, like the self, worked more or less well, if not healthy. And it will again do so once the attack is warded off. The intruder is destroyed and the organism, like the self, is re-established in its integrity. There's a, long, there's a long tradition of psychological and philosophical thinking that has repudiated exactly this idea of the self as an autonomous entity, a self that defends its sovereignty against hostile intruders. There are many books on the history of this idea and the history of its um, repudiation as a valid model of uh, human self and identity. But it seems that this idea is not only a veteran hall, a veteran battle horse, I already mentioned the battle horses here, but I have not mentioned that it is also a comeback kit. It returns again and again, irrespective of the defeats it has already suffered. As a cultural figures, figure, it reappears, especially in times of crisis, times of catastrophe and disaster that can be depicted in tropes of an external attacker. The self in crisis is the self attacked, as if the attack on the self, um, first of all, confirms the idea of the self. Rom Harry has remarked that there are psychological concepts that are particularly prone to being substantialized and ontologized. Given certain conducive conditions, they are like avatars that mutate into human characters. In terms of a cultural narratology, this is an interesting process. Take um, pre modern myths, which are comparable tropical figures. Being originally narrative forms and processes, they transform and take on a robust, lifelike gestalt, reappearing for centuries and millennia. Much of this uh, mythical uh, substantializing happens in storied forms. In the life of a culture, there is, there is a lot of narrative material. The vaguer it is, the more it serves as rough material for this transformation. Take this one. The self leads a peaceful and idyllic life somewhere, but then, out of a sudden, 
a challenger arrives, it emerges out of the blue, or more precisely, out of an anonymous shop in a remote Chinese marketplace, a somehow archaic uh, wet market. There might be bats involved, uh, dogs and rats, and who knows, even early evolutionary creatures. From the beginning, this challenger, the enemy, has a name, Corona. I wonder if any marketing agency could have come up with a more, with a more compelling name. <clears throat> now we have the two protagonists of many stories told by, told by psychologists, but also by epidemiologists, political commentators, and countless other pundits. Corona and the self in crisis. And there's me again, as I'm reading and a in the science section of the New York Times, written by a psychologist, the question, how can such a tiny virus become so powerful, giving such a massive narcissistic blow to the modern self? It is helpful to remember that uh, the term narcissistic blow also <clears throat> has a venerable, a venerable history in psychology. In 1917, Sigmund Freud distinguished three narcissistic injuries, or wounds or scars, to characterize events that challenge the narcissism, or more generically, the self-esteem of a person or a group of, person, of persons. Freud uh, argued that the general narcissism of the Western self experienced three fundamental injuries. These three humiliations of human self-esteem came in the wake of three scientific discoveries, namely that of Copernicus, according to which we are not in the center of the universe at all, that of uh, Darwin, who showed that we are not of godly origin but evolved in the same way as apes and, in fact, as viruses. And finally, Freud referred to the psychoanalytical discovery of the unconscious, the fact that we are not masters in our own house. <clears throat> now, Freud has often been criticized for individualizing and bio biologizing certain aspects of human psychology. But um, I think his view of the historical dimension of the Western self, of the various crises it experienced, can be seen as an attempt to culturally, culturally, to culturally localize these crises, localize them clearly beyond the, the individual domain. Freud might have neglected many other social historical aspects, but it is remarkable that at a time we are in the early 20th century, when universalist claims of Western psychology and philosophy were generally taken for granted, he conceived of the idea of the self as taking shape from the beginning as a culturally specific psychological construct, a construct of crisis, a defense construct against the crisis. Freud, um, of course, Freud was not the only one. There has been a, a long-standing tradition in Western thinking addressing issues of human existence, of uh, self and identity as, as ever changing and principally open and, uh, yes, even elusive against the cultural background of modernity and modernism, many philosophers and writers lost the self-certainty and the self-certitude characteristic of earlier times. One of the counter concepts to the, to the modern self is the medieval self, or more generically, the classical Christian self. In contrast with the crisis-ridden 
modern self, the Christian self, is firm and stable because it is ultimately grounded in God. That is, its basic condition is that of stability, even beyond death. Whereas the modern self is subject to the enlightenment imperative that it has to be created by each human individual. Dare to make use of your own understanding, including your own self-understanding. For a long time, the assumption was common that the pre-modern Christian self was the original stable rock bed that became more and more shaky, the more external intruders like Copernicus, Kant, Darwin, Freud, and the likes took center stage. In his study on the historical emergence of modern self-understanding, entitled Sources of the Self, the Origin of the Modern Identity, Charles Taylor has rejected this assumption. He has shown that intellectually, the erosion of the idea of a given and stable self started already much earlier, in fact, with Christianity itself. For Taylor, the Christian self was from the very beginning anything but stable and consistent. Even, no doubt, there, there, there was the wish, the desire, the, the hope, perhaps even the, the promise to reach this uh, ideal state of mind. But it always, <clears throat> it always had an aura of otherworldliness. In the real world, things are messy, and so is the self. In the human world, whether in Christian or modern terms, <clears throat> there seem to be some fundamental questions, uh, writes Taylor, uh, question that individuals in the West ask about themselves, which cannot be sufficiently answered with any general doctrine of human nature, whether religious, philosophical, or scientific, whether referring to reason, soul, or biology. Despite all these doctrines and the answers they offer, there still remains a question of the self, of the meaning of my being in the world, of, of my existence. We may call this my understanding of myself as a self. But uh, as, uh, as Taylor claims, the word self does not refer to an existing or imagined entity, a quality, an empirical form of the human being. It rather circumscribes an idea, an area of questioning. It designate, designates the kind of being of which this question of identity can be asked. Let me add, let me add a last um, aspect of Taylor's understanding of the, of the modern tradition of the self that I find interesting in this context. This tradition is the tradition of a self that lives and experiences his or her crisis as an inherent quality of human existence. Drawing on Taylor, we might say that the process of self-exploration is part and parcel of establishing one's identity. The search for one's self takes place in order to come to terms with oneself, not in order to tackle an external crisis, to, to ward off an, uh, an enemy intruder who challenges the health and peace of mind and of an otherwise uh, firm and stabilized self. I want um, to finish with a few words on a film, one of my lockdown films, Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. Bergman 
in this film tells the story of a knight, Antonius Block, who returns from a crusade to his uh, homeland, Sweden, that is devastated by the plague. Now there's an historical background to this story, the, the pandemic that ravaged uh, Europe in the Middle Ages, killing about one third of its people, of its people. Now the knight, completely disillusioned, comes home facing his own death. However, he rests uh, from, uh, re rests his life from death for the duration of a match of chess. And this time, he wants to find the meaning of existence. Well, to make it short, Bloch does not find it. He does not get an answer because, uh, well, even death does not know an answer. And so Bloch dies unredeemed. But despite this bleak outlook, the horrors of the Black Death, the knight, portrayed by the great Swedish actor Max von Sydow, is determined until the end to explore his options, the possibility of still another layer of life that he, irrespective of the many battles he fought and lost, might not have discovered yet, and be it only to keep the question open. Like all humans, even this mythical knight dies. But there was at least one moment in his life, a space, an island in the flux of time in which this question, in which these questions could be asked, in which they could become the dominant form of life itself, of being or having a self during the chess match with death. Do you ever stop questioning? Death asks, and Bergman's knight shakes his head. I cannot. At the same time, Bergman's film investigates how one of the great myths of the self emerges. The myth of the sovereign self, the autonomous subject, the Western ego. At least for the time span of one chess match, Knight and Tony Block appears to be on equal footage with death, the ultimate challenger who always wins. Bergman's film is like a myth, it's itself like a myth-like narrative. But at the end, Block rejects the myth, even without any idea of uh, how to overcome the crisis or to win the chess game that is his life. He leaves the question of the meaning of his existence unanswered, as he leaves us with an impression of his life and a sense of his existence as something that cannot be distinguished from the search for himself.